One of the big stories I, I wanted to jump straight into was Enzo Fernandez to Chelsea Football Club, 120 million. It feels very advanced and it feels very close. But what is the, the latest as far as your, your understanding goes, Ben? So this would be a statement signing for Chelsea if they can pull it off. And it sends a message to the market. Of course, the fee is going to be very high. But the point is, Chelsea are getting a player that a lot of their rivals would love. And if they succeed, they're doing so a window earlier than others either thought they could get him or were prepared to move because of how high the fee is. So in Portugal, the belief seemingly is that the deal is almost done. That's not quite my understanding. So we have to be very careful, I think, in how we describe things. It will move today as well. So anybody watching this on a pre-record has to understand that we're talking at 11.19 and by 11.20, it can even change because that's how these negotiations work. But the overview of the situation is as follows. Chelsea, the only suitor talking to Benfica about Enzo Fernandez. That's number one. And it's key because there are reports out there that say that Liverpool tried an offer, that Newcastle were in the conversation. And yes, there's admiration from those clubs. And yes, Liverpool might have entertained an offer for Enzo Fernandez in the summer for closer to market value. And that could still be the case if this deal doesn't come off. But Chelsea, the only suitor talking to Enzo Fernandez. And their initial tactic has been to offer above the 120 million euros release clause and in doing so gain more preferential terms. It's also not true, by the way, that Chelsea can offset any of this transfer fee under so-called youth development under financial fair play. And as a consequence, if they pay it on the release clause, then they have to offer all of that money in a lump sum. And that is why Chelsea want to pay slightly above the release clause, close to 130 million euros, and then divide up the payment terms. And that means that the transfer fee is not that much higher than the release clause, but they can offset the payment over more than one financial fair play cycle. And as importantly, if the payment terms are preferable and lengthy in Chelsea's favour, by the time they actually pay the transfer fee, there will be a belief that Enzo Fernandez is worth what they've paid. So that's tactic number one. Now, if they don't go down that line, there's an opposite extreme if Benfica rebuff them, which is they lowball. And that may seem like such a strange thing to say, but it's really important to stress another thing here, that 120 million euros is massive. It's about 70 million euros above current market value. And yes, we can debate current market value and there's lots of different metrics for it. But ultimately, it's 70 million euros right now above current market value. And Benfica know that, which is why, as I've reported many times, they were caught off guard by this Chelsea bid and approach. Therefore, if they know deep down that there's probably nobody that will pay 120 million euros via the release clause. They've got a choice to make. Do they want a larger number, but not having preferable payment terms? Or would they prefer something way above market value, but below the release clause, still in a lump sum? So it may come down to do Benfica want a lump sum, but then Chelsea will not pay them the release clause in all likelihood. Or do they want a higher sum, but divided by payment terms that ultimately benefit Chelsea, not Benfica? But it's still so big that they would get a relatively large first payment. And the payment terms may not be equal either. They might still get a larger payment up front and then the rest of it divided by four, five, six, seven years. Chelsea will want ultimately as long as possible. And the other thing in all of this as well is that a percentage goes to River Plate. So Benfica don't actually get all of the money and therefore the whole package compared to keeping on to him until the end of the season is perhaps not as preferable as it appears due to the fact that over 30 million euros goes to River Plate, which is fantastic business for them because they only sold him to Benfica in June of last year. So these are the different considerations. And then the situation is this. Yes, in Portugal, you will read that it's almost done. I would classify it as advanced, but not final. And the reason why it's not final is because Chelsea, as of yesterday, and as I say, 
we have to be careful here because it's moving fast and people might watch this in an hour or two and say, you said this, but now we're hearing this. And it gets because there'll be meetings today, there'll be meetings tomorrow. But as of yesterday, it was not Chelsea negotiating with Benfica. It's been Chelsea laying down their initial card and then Benfica internally establishing with a pretty divided board whether or not they are prepared to sell for anything other than the release clause at this point. And what's helping Chelsea is the fact that Enzo Fernandez wants Chelsea and there's pressure, therefore, on Benfica because the player's looking to capitalise on a phenomenal World Cup where he was the young player of the tournament and he lifted the trophy. So as of last night, Chelsea were waiting upon Benfica to say, having started engagement, which Chelsea see as encouraging, are they now prepared to close this deal? And if they are, then Chelsea will get it done very quickly. If they're not, then that's where the other options that I've outlined may be necessary for Chelsea to try and change their approach. So it's heading in a very positive direction for Chelsea, but this isn't football manager and this isn't crazy Chelsea getting a deal done at all costs. If it gets to the point where the deal is not sensible for Chelsea, they'll walk away. And a lot of Chelsea fans also ask me on Enzo, why are they not pushing harder? Why are they not getting it done? It's been three days of actual negotiations during which we've also had New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. And we've had a game for Benfica and away at Braga where lots of senior figures were travelling. And then an away game for Chelsea at Nottingham Forest where Christopher Vivelle, who's involved, came back and was at the city ground for that game. And there's intermediaries involved too. So this is something that Chelsea have obviously been plotting for longer than three days. But in terms of actual direct conversations with Benfica, we're three days in. There's plenty of time left in the window. And of course, both clubs would like it resolved fast so they know where they stand. But we're three days in. And it's not common sense for Chelsea to just push and push and push. Because if they do that, they send a message to the market that they're always going to come back, that they're always going to fight. And it's over aggressive. And if you do that in negotiations, then Benfica just bide their time and say, well, even if we reject, they'll come back with a higher offer. And eventually Benfica will get everything that they want from this and Chelsea will get the worst deal in the world. So it's very important that Chelsea stick to their guns, stick to their valuation, stick to either their payment terms, or if that doesn't work, stick to a much lower offer than the release clause if Benfica's priority is to get a fee in one lump sum. And still those options and that back and forth and that cat and mouse is taking place. And Chelsea, as of last night, were waiting on a Benfica answer. So at the moment, what's more important is internal Benfica discussions, not Chelsea to Benfica discussions. Yeah. And as soon as Chelsea get their answer, it will either be positive and get done very quickly or Chelsea will have to change their approach. So I think that it's all very encouraging. It's all pretty advanced. There's full buy-in on the player side, but we wait and see whether Benfica are prepared to give Chelsea the deal that they want. And if they're not, then I actually think that Chelsea would walk away. Yeah, I mean, the, the financial element is so interesting because there was that rumour, as you've already put to bed, around does it come under youth development? It doesn't. But interestingly, paying $130 million is over a six-year period is less risky than $90 million cash up front because, as we all know, net spend is, is real from the perspective of the way the, the, the computer games do it and the basic way that certain tabloids will do it. But in reality, net spend doesn't exist. If you buy a player where counting works, which is what FFP is connected to, if you buy a player for 130 million and in two years he's flopped and you sell him for 80 million, but you've only paid 40 of that 130, on an accounting level, you actually make a profit on the player, which is what the uh, FFP feeds into. So I actually understand Chelsea's method of maybe paying above the release clause spreading the cost because there's theoretically less risk than 90 or 100 million pound cash outlay in the beginning, which you never get back if the player doesn't perform. So mm. there's, there's so many elements to this deal that I find intriguing. And it's one of the reasons I love transfers. I'm also looking at it from a Chelsea point of view that they are kind of struggling at the moment. Another game where they, I mean, I think in their last seven games, they've only won one or lost six, six or seven games they've won one match, lost three or four drawn games. And their fans are becoming angry. They're becoming frustrated at Graham Potter. 
Um, some fully behind the Todd Bowley process, and though it takes time. So Enzo is, a, I, I suppose, one of those signings where it will show the world that people are still serious. We know Badashila, as you, you, you and David Ornstein revealed yesterday, is done and dusted and over the line. So, yeah, it's going to be an interesting one to see what actually happens now with this deal and the mood around the dressing room and what Chelsea fans make of it, because it's big, big money. They're blowing everybody else out the water, and it's going to take the spending near 500 million in one season for the Bowley regime, which is, I suppose, a lot of people just can't get their head. They, they view it as Chelsea are just throwing money at the situation. But are Chelsea building something more substantial behind the scenes? Oh, absolutely. We know that in the course probably of the next three windows and two seasons, Chelsea's entire identity will have changed because they will have a multi-club model. They will have consistency around an approach and a strategy. And we'll start to see whether all of these young signings on long-term contracts are settled and breaking through and working. And at the same time, we will know whether the loyalty and investment in Graham Potter has worked and will have more than just a six-month period to judge this new and highly ambitious group. And then away from the football side and away from any multi-club model investment or purchases, we'll also watch the development of the brand and we'll start to see in more practical terms a roadmap for the redevelopment of Sanford Bridge as well. So Chelsea shouldn't be judged now what they have to balance is the urgency of the short term to make sure that they don't fall too far from grace and by grace of course I actually mean Champions League football and they have to plan the long-term strategy and there is that balance because sometimes you need urgency for now and other times you have to stick to your guns and Manchester United are in the same position they need a traditional number nine they need to replace Cristiano Ronaldo but there will likely be a sale in 2023 and Eric Ten Hag has longer term plans and desires so there's a need for the now and for Manchester United they're in a better position because they're on course for top four at the moment. It's going to be tight, but they've had a much more positive start to the season than Chelsea. From Chelsea's perspective, they know that they can't fall into the bottom half of the table. And if they lose to Manchester City, they're not too far from that potentially. And they also know that the fan mood, because of how many trophies Abramovich won, is quite tense at the moment because the fan base are not only looking at 21 trophies under Abramovich, they're also seeing the sacking of Tuchel and Graham Potter coming in and they're wondering what the strategy is. They're wondering where the improvement is and the 1-1 draw at Nottingham Forest certainly doesn't help. And it's a shame almost because football is so quick to turn and you can draw with Forrest. And if they announce Enzo Fernandez this morning, the fan base fall in love with the ownership group again. And the amount of Mondays I wake up and hear Potter out, Bowley doesn't know what he's doing. And then Tuesday morning I wake up and it's, wow, what's Bowley cooking? Enzo Fernandez is coming in and Chelsea are going to have a resurgence and get into Champions League this season, win the Champions League this season, win the league next season. So football fans are quite fickle, particularly on Twitter in that respect. And the level of spending and ambition is high, but the progress on the football field is a little bit slower at the moment. And I think that Graham Potter's issue is that he's almost overthinking it. I don't think he knows his best 11. I don't think that you need as much tactical nous as he did at Brighton. At Brighton. That's not to suggest that the manager doesn't have to think deeply about how he's going to win a game. But I do think that when you manage a Chelsea football club, you can turn up to Nottingham Forest with a default position of authority and you know you're going to have the ball and you know you've got more quality. So you just play your game and you play your game with confidence. So when you go 1-0 up, you try and kill off the game. Whereas I think if you're Brighton away at Forest and you go 1-0 up, that's when as a manager you start to think about how tactically are we going to shore things up? How tactically are we maybe going to get a second goal on the counter-attack? How tactically are we going to weather the storm of what the home team are going to do? But if yeah. you're Chelsea, you just keep playing your game. And if Forrest come forward, you have the confidence to win the ball back and make sure that you're hungry and have energy and stay positive. And then because of your quality and because spaces will emerge, you'll get the goals. So the surprise, I think, in Forrest from Potter's point of view 
was as soon as they went 1-0 up, Forrest came at them, Chelsea sat back. They didn't have a shot on target. They only had one shot on goal. And you're thinking to yourself, but regardless of what Forrest do, Chelsea should have the quality to simply win the ball back. And if they win the ball back, they've got the pace and they've got the yeah. talent to at least create opportunities. And if one of those opportunities comes off, you kill the game off. So I think he overthinks it. I think sometimes he's still got his Brighton mentality of we're Brighton and we're away from home and we're ahead. And it's like you're Chelsea and Chelsea away from home and Chelsea ahead against lower ranked opposition don't need the same tactical complexities as other teams. They just need to play their own game and realise that yeah. they're a dominant side, they're a better side. So I think that this plays into generally Chelsea not yet having a clear public sense of identity. And I use the word public very intentionally because privately there's a clear strategy, privately there's a multi-club model, and privately I think Graham Potter has a real idea of where he wants to take Chelsea, but he knows it's going to take time. But publicly, yeah. because of the injuries, because of the midfield needing strengthening, because of Aubameyang not looking happy, because of Sterling perhaps looking a bit uncomfortable when he's asked to play in a slightly different role, we're just seeing a range of disjointed decisions that may well, in hindsight, all add up. And everyone will have to hold their hands up and say, oh, I now see what they were doing. Yeah. But at the moment, there's just that little bit of panic and the Bournemouth win calm things and the Forest draw has created a little bit more unrest, which again makes that Manchester City game hugely important. But I've said it before and I'll say it again. Chelsea are to be judged in the long term in a year, if not longer. Certainly three windows time, this window included. And then it should become apparent exactly what they're building and why they've taken a number of these different decisions. But obviously, football fans paying harder money judge them now and get annoyed when their side doesn't win, get annoyed if their side doesn't reach Champions League football, gets annoyed if their side's won one in their last seven games. And quite right too in some respects, but I have to reiterate what I've said before. This group is six months in. The very future of the club was in doubt. They've spent Abramovich-like levels. They're having to learn as they go. There's a new board. There's a new recruitment team. Some of those new recruitment members haven't even started. So to expect it all to be smooth and plain sailing and success overnight, I just think is unrealistic. 